Good afternoon. Well, first, I just, as the students are leaving, I just want to, again, congratulate you on some very impressive teachers and students. And I didn't know that I'd have the opportunity to get to share that with you all. So that was a very special moment and exciting to see the next generation of scientists being trained. Just thinking about what will come in the course of their lifetime is just terribly exciting. And thank you, Bob, for that introduction. Um, as he mentioned, I am Anna Abram. I am FDA's Deputy Commissioner for Policy Planning legislation and analysis. It is a mouthful, I know. Uh, I am truly honored and humbled by the opportunity to serve at and to represent FDA, an agency that embraces its vital mission to protect and promote the public health of all Americans. I know that this is a goal that inspires all of us here today as we collaborate on these important endeavors on behalf of the patients that we serve. I'm delighted to be here today to speak with so many distinguished leaders of the Massachusetts life sciences industry. I want to pass along the good wishes of our commissioner, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, who was disappointed he couldn't be with you himself here today. Dr. Gottlieb understands as well as anyone the importance of bioscience to the future of healthcare and our society. And he is also aware that Massachusetts is considered among the world's leading life sciences communities a fact confirmed by the extraordinary range and accomplished biotechnology companies, academic institutions, foundations, and other organizations involved in life sciences and healthcare who make up this organization and are represented at this meeting and are also recognized leaders in this critical work on behalf of patients. This organization and its members plays an essential role in developing and delivering products and programs that advance innovation and provide enormous and continuing benefits to consumers and patients. You appreciate better than most that this is a time of unprecedented scientific, technological, and medical innovation. As Dr. Gottlieb has commented, we are at an inflection point for science, medicine, and policy. This is truly an exciting time to be on the front lines of public health. And indeed, we see evidence of this every day of how your work, as well as that of FDA's scientists and researchers, and the collaboration that comes from these shared endeavors, is leading to groundbreaking developments in public health. New applications of science, engineering, and technology are helping create novel platforms to address more diseases, identify patients' needs and benefits earlier in the development process, and spot potential safety issues earlier and more effectively. These developments are wide-ranging, from advances in regenerative medicine and the resulting treatments and cures, to collaborative efforts to combat antimicrobial resistance, to mobile monitoring that offers patients and physicians more accurate, accessible, and actionable clinical information to groundbreaking gene therapies and targeted medicines and the diagnostic tests that guide them. In short, it is a time of unprecedented opportunity to make a real and meaningful difference in the lives of so many people, not only here in Massachusetts, but across our nation and the world. Along with the remarkable scientific advances and applications that you've been discussing here, at the meeting are many important and complementary regulatory developments. Some of these changes have been the result of greater scientific understanding. Others have grown out directly from conversations with industry. Still others have come as a result of increased congressional interest and support. They include improvements that have made the development process faster and more effective without sacrificing safety. As a result, innovators are able to more quickly and effectively translate the potential of your research into products, therapies, and services that are making a difference in the lives of patients. Numbers don't tell the whole story, but I want to offer a few numbers that I think help demonstrate some of the progress at FDA. In 2017, FDA approved a record number of novel drugs and biologics a record number of drugs with orphan indications, and more generic drugs than had been approved before in the agency's history. 
FDA also set a record for the number of novel medical devices approved, which was four times the number approved in 2009. This is due to the many advances in science and medicine and also the new and more effective processes in place at FDA. FDA is working hard to keep up with the rapid advances in science and medicine and applying the best available science to the work that we do. And we're also committed to the continued training and education of the workforce. One of the four pillars of Dr. Gottlieb's 2018 strategic roadmap is focused on strengthening FDA's scientific workforce. The Office of Scientific Professional Development within the Office of the Chief Scientist offers numerous educational activities that address continuing education needs of FDA staff, providing the FDA scientific community and health professionals the chance to stay current with advances in science and applied scientific data in various clinical fields, as well as to hear the perspectives of scientists and clinicians on the application of regulatory scientific knowledge. And the Office of Chief Scientist's Office of Regulatory Science and Innovation supports the Centers of Excellence in Regulatory Science and Innovation, which are partnerships with academic institutions that offer lectures, workshops, and academic degrees in regulatory science that FDA scientists have earned. We are also working hard to leverage the tools the 21st Century Cures Act gave the agency to make sure we are prepared with the scientific workforce we need now and in the future. As our daily work at and across the agency affirms, science is the cornerstone of our vital mission to protect and promote public health. Complementing our efforts to leverage scientific advances are the strides we've made and continue to make in developing new, updated, and streamlined regulatory processes that give us the flexibility to respond more quickly and thoroughly to your scientific development needs. I know that many of you have taken advantage of the expedited development and review programs FDA has developed. Priority review, fast track, accelerated approval, and breakthrough therapy designation that are helping to speed the pathway from discovery to development with the ultimate goal of the delivery of promising products that help the patients in need of them. FDA's regulatory reform efforts are important to informing how we move forward with better, more modern, efficient, and predictable processes across the entire development, review, and oversight continuum. Moreover, it is a process that increasingly involves earlier ongoing and more extensive communication with developers like you. And we're continuing to expand these efforts to harness innovation and drug and biological product manufacturing technologies, which is supported by the President's fiscal year 2009 budget. I'm sorry, 2019 budget, I just lost a decade. The 2019 budget. As you know, U.S. pharmaceutical and biotechnology industries are moving toward advanced manufacturing technologies, such as continuous manufacturing, to improve the agility, flexibility, cost, and robustness of manufacturing processes. Indeed, several of your members were among the first companies to produce an FDA-approved drug on a continuous processing line. The various advanced manufacturing platforms under development offer enormous potential to accelerate new, more targeted therapies, enhance product quality, and bolster stability in the U.S. drug supply to meet domestic and global needs. For example, continuous manufacturing could support needs to ramp up our vaccine supply more easily on short notice and adapting as necessary to address emerging infectious diseases such as influenza. One important area of focus for Commissioner Gottlieb and FDA, which directly involves many of you, is our work to expand access to generic drugs and biosimilars. By increasing choice and competition through timely access to safe, quality, and effective medicines, we can help more Americans get and afford the medicines they need. Under Dr. Gottlieb's Drug Competition Action Plan, FDA has been working to strengthen the generic review process to increase availability of these safe, high quality, and more affordable drugs. The plan includes a renewed effort to advance generic drug reviews and approvals in as timely a manner as possible, including in more complex product areas that traditionally have been more challenging and therefore have lacked the generic competition we've seen in other areas over the years. 
Although FDA does not have a direct role in drug pricing, we do have an important indirect impact. When we ensure that our regulatory requirements are streamlined, predictable, and science-based, and when we provide developers with our knowledge and insight through clarifying guidance, that can help to reduce the time, uncertainty, and cost of drug development. FDA has already made significant progress in each of the three major components of our Drug Competition Action Plan. First, streamlining the generic drug review process to increase efficiency and effectiveness. Second, supporting the development and enhancing the review of complex generic drug products. And third, reducing the so-called gaming that frustrates and delays generic drug approvals and extends brand monopolies beyond what Congress intended with the Hatch-Waxman Amendments of 1984. I already mentioned our record number of generic approvals last year, 1,027 new generic drugs, 214 more than our previous record of 813 set in 2016. And notably, this also included 80 first generic drugs, which are especially important to spurring competition that helps lower prescription drug costs. This is one indication of how we've strengthened our review process. But I also want to underscore that this success was due in part to the collaboration between FDA and industry to establish a robust framework for generic drug user fees back in 2012. GDUFA 1 allowed us to rebuild the entire generics program, including the hiring of critically needed staff, which in turn helped us begin what would become successive years of record-breaking numbers of approvals. We know that the continued success of the generic drug user fee program directly depends on FDA's and industry's continued collaboration, and we are committed to meeting the new review goals set forth in GDUFA 2 and leveraging GDUFA 2 pre-ANDA program to streamline the development and review of ANDAs for complex generic drug products. FDA recently published the Good ANDA Submission Practices, Draft Guidance, and the Manual of Policies and Procedures, or MAP, for Good ANDA Assessment Practices, which together will help increase the quality and completeness of ANDA submissions and will streamline and improve aspects of the ANDA review process. We are also working on a number of guidances and other initiatives to add scientific and regulatory clarity for complex generic drugs which will help ensure that the review and approval of generic versions of complex drug products proceed in ways that are as modern and efficient as possible. FDA has also been active in working to prevent the gaming of the FDA regulatory system by drug companies that seek to delay entry of generic competition. Brand manufacturers using tactics to prevent generic developers from accessing doses of the branded drug they seek to copy is one such type of gaming. Generic developers need access to these samples of the brand drug to, to conduct required comparative testing and develop their generic product for FDA approval. And so brand manufacturers' refusal to sell doses of the brand drug to a generic developer creates a barrier to the submission and approval of generic applications. This refusal can take different forms. For example, a brand manufacturer may exploit through commercial arrangements or otherwise FDA-imposed distribution restrictions designed to mitigate safety risks to prevent sales to generic competitors. We've been working to evaluate ways that FDA can help reduce these kinds of gaming. The President's fiscal year 2019 budget includes an important legislative proposal to help address gaming. The proposal would make the tentative approval of a subsequent generic drug applicant that is blocked solely by a first applicant's 180-day exclusivity, where the first applicant has not yet received final approval, a trigger of the first applicant's 180-day exclusivity. This means that the period of exclusivity would immediately begin for the first applicant. This proposal would enhance competition, facilitate more timely access to generic drugs, and is expected to create meaningful savings. This proposal would help ensure that FDA's regulatory framework encourages competition in the generic space and would allow the agency to use the full scope of FDA's authorities to achieve our vital public health mission. Our focus on enhancing drug competition also includes efforts to facilitate and promote the entry of biosimilars into the marketplace. An increase in the number of available biosimilars should lead to more robust price competition and ultimately a meaningful reduction in costs and better public health outcomes for patients. We recognize that biosimilar sponsors may face challenges 
and bringing a biosimilar to market even after it is approved by FDA. Although FDA approved five biosimilars in 2017, bringing the total number of approvals to nine, we believe that only three biosimilars are currently being marketed. Although such challenges are outside the agency's control, FDA remains focused on making the review of marketing applications for biosimilar and interchangeable products more modern and efficient, increasing regulatory certainty for biosimilar manufacturers and other stakeholders, and educating the public about biosimilar and interchangeable products. In 2017, FDA's commitments under BASUFA II brought several new process enhancements to FDA's biosimilars program. For example, BASUFA II commitments included improvements to the management of formal meetings between FDA and sponsors in the Biosimilar Biologic Product Development Program. Commitments under BASUFA II also are intended to bring significant improvements to FDA's process for reviewing biosimilar applications. Under the new BASUFA II review program, FDA aims to increase the efficiency of the review process and minimize the number of review cycles for biosimilar applications. Complementing these efforts and to encourage an uptick in available biosimilars, FDA continues to develop guidance on the development of biosimilar and interchangeable products. For example, in 2017, the agency issued draft guidance on demonstrating interchangeability with a reference product. FDA's guidance development commitments in BASUFA II speak to the importance to the agency of continuing its efforts to clarify the 351K regulatory pathway for manufacturers of biosimilars and other stakeholders. We're also working to increase the agency's capacity to inform the public about biosimilarity and interchangeability. The agency recently launched a public education campaign that emphasizes the robustness of FDA's biosimilar review standards. And FDA plans to work on additional research with healthcare professionals to learn more about the types of information prescribers need to properly communicate with their patients about biosimilars. As in the generic space, the agency also is committed to adopting strong policies and taking action when necessary to reduce gaming of statutory and regulatory requirements. And we will be considering ways to help ensure that drug companies do not use anti-competitive strategies to delay biosimilar or interchangeable development and competition. Today, I've, t I've tried to touch on a few aspects of the regulatory reform efforts that we're focused on at FDA. I hope you can see that modernizing our regulatory framework and making them more efficient is a particular focus of FDA's work under our commissioner, Dr. Scott Gottlieb's leadership. Whether it is through our efforts to promote competition and fulfill the promise of generic drugs and biosimilars, or to encourage and support the innovation that is blossoming within our bioscience community, we will do everything we can to put in place and enforce regulatory frameworks that reflect both modern risks and opportunities. Our policies and processes must be as modern as the products that we're being asked to evaluate. And our regulatory frameworks must efficiently employ tools that allow us to achieve our vital consumer protection role, not just now, but in the future, as science, medicine, and technologies continue to advance. We look forward to working with you and supporting your efforts to advance innovative medical products on behalf of the American consumers and patients we both serve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Uh, I know time is tight and you do have to catch a flight black, back to Washington, D.C., but we were able to grab some questions from the audience earlier, and really I could ask two of them at once here. Uh, one has to do with the opioid crisis. It's been a topic everywhere. It's ubiquitous. What does the FDA view as its role in helping to combat the opioid crisis? And then another question, too, that you might want to hit as well. Uh, yesterday, part of the theme all day, we, we talk about putting the patient in the middle of everything that we do. So many of us are in this industry because of uh, personal experiences and loved ones and, and whatnot. What steps is the FDA taking to achieve its goal of actually empowering patients? So the opioids and the patients. Great. I'll start with the opioids question, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to that issue. Um, I don't need to tell anyone in this room the tragic and staggering human toll that the opiate epidemic is taking on communities across our nation. I think all of us know someone personally and or know somebody who knows somebody who has been impacted 
by this public health crisis. And so I just want to take the opportunity to underscore that combating the opioid crisis is a top priority for the administration, the top priority for the department, and it is also a top priority for the agency under Commissioner Gottlieb's leadership. One of the first actions the commissioner took after he was confirmed uh, by the Senate and he joined the helm of the agency was to establish an opiate policy steering committee. And one of the reasons he did that was to pull together senior career leadership um, to look at what new opportunities there were to look at the, the issues and challenges that have surfaced as part of opioid use and opioid misuse. And so there's a number of actions that we've taken that have stemmed from the opiate policy steering committee ultimately stemming from the point of looking at how we can reduce the rate of new addictions. And so we're focused on helping to reduce that rate of new addictions by looking at policies around packaging, making sure that prescribing is uh, properly aligning with clinical need, but also looking at how we can provide greater clarity and certainty to bringing forward abuse deterrent um, products, as well as products that don't have the same addiction profile or characteristics as some of the opiate products um, currently being used and available. So it's something that we're really trying to look at across all areas. Um, we have an important role to play in working with um, collaborators such as yourself to, as we all work, to address what we know is um, a very serious epidemic and one we're committed to doing our part to help address. I think as part of that is a nice segue to your question about empowering consumers. I think in all that we do and all that you do, it's about patience. And so as we continue to work through the opiate epidemic, we can't lose sight of that there are patients behind this, both current and future, who do have pain needs that need to be met. And so how do we provide further options for them that won't perhaps present the same risk pro profile and give prescribers more options in, in meeting those needs, as well as helping those through medication-assisted therapy um, those who are dependent upon opiates help to achieve as high quality life as possible. And so I'll then segue into your, your second question about empowering consumers. That, at the end of the day, it's about what all everything that we're doing. It's about patients, about achieving our vital mission to protect and promote public health. And I think one of the real exciting um, changes that has occurred in the life sciences area, in the development area, is particularly this conversation and focus on patient-focused drug development. But when I say patient-focused drug development, I think very much we're thinking about this across the continuum of our regulatory decision-making. What we do at the end of the day, it's, it's about patients and consumers. It's a shared mission that you have. And so starting back with, I think, PDUFA 5, and we saw themes of this reiterated in the 21st Century Cures Act, which we're working hard to implement, as well as then codified in the PDUFA 6 agreement, is really how can we together advance a paradigm that is predictable to making sure that we're capturing and applying those patient inputs into the regulatory decision making. And I say regulatory decision making because I think very much we don't just think about this around the development piece, although the development piece is obviously very critical. Um, particularly for conditions that, you know, are, are harder to treat, that are more challenging, that do present perhaps different risk benefit and quality of life challenges. And so it's something that we've tried to, to integrate across our work. I think actually just earlier this week we had another workshop on the topic of patient-focused drug development. So it's something that we're continuing to, to look to employ and implement. And as we do that, as with all that we do, trying to do so in as modern and efficient way that provides as much predictability as possible to those who are out there working to develop and bring forward these therapies on behalf of patients. Thank you, Thank you very much.